to provide some of these services, and they'll become more and more desirable. The service industries will prosper in the coming decades. Those individuals who have messages of poverty and economic struggle embedded in their subconscious minds will find themselves experiencing hard times no matter what the economy is doing. Negative information about money is handed down to the point where most people today are walking around with ideas and beliefs about money which have nothing to do with what is actually going on economically. The only way to eliminate financial anxiety in one's life is to move forward with new beliefs, new habits, new actions concerning money. Carrying a hundred dollar bill around if you haven't been doing it is a new attitude, a new habit. The popular myth is that obtaining a large amount of money will relieve anxiety, but this is rarely true. Once negative money habits and beliefs are entrenched in your consciousness, larger amounts of money merely lead to larger anxieties and larger fears. Trying to change one's economic situation without understanding the underlying emotional obstacles is like trying to lose weight without looking at one's eating habits. Temporary relief may be possible, but the old patterns are certain to reappear. One of the things to look at in terms of financial self-confidence is you as a giver and a receiver. Because this reflects the self-confidence you have, the way in which you receive and the way in which you give. You might want to remember what giving and receiving was like from your parents. What was it like when you gave them a gift? What was it like when they gave you one? Look at some of the things you've experienced in giving and receiving in your life. What's the most you ever gave to another person? Can you think of five things you recently gave to others? How personal were these gifts? How much were they a reflection of your individual personality? On a scale of one to ten, rate yourself as a giving person. Ten being the highest, the most giving. Picture the last time you gave something special to someone. Visualize their reaction. Is the effort you make in giving directly related to the response you get or expect? Can you feel good giving something without expecting anything in the way of thanks or response? Try giving something to someone anonymously. Remember the nicest thing anyone ever gave you. What made it nice? What kind of relationship did you have with this person before and after the gift? What have you done to let that person know you appreciated receiving that gift? Try to relive the exact feelings you had receiving the gift and maybe pick one word that describes those feelings. Look at how much you'll receive from others during this week and how much you're going to give to others. Keep a list. Keep a chart comparing the two. How much you give, how much you receive. Count everything you give that makes someone else feel good and everything you get that makes you feel good. Whether it's a smile or some material object, are your giving and receiving experiences in balance? Write an essay, no more than a hundred words. Me, as a giving, receiving person. In picking out a gift for someone, is my degree of affection for that person reflected in the amount of money I exchange for that gift? There's a question you can ask yourself, and if the answer is yes, you might want to look at the rigid pattern in this area of your life. An interesting experiment to just break your habit pattern is to buy a very simple but caring gift for someone you really love and an expensive gift for someone you just know slightly but like and admire. What matters most to you? The gift itself or the way in which someone gives it? Do you equate a great gift with someone who really loves you or does the energy and affection with which they deliver the gift have something to do with your feelings? One of the fondest gift receiving memories I have is when a friend went to the trouble of looking up a recipe and preparing six chocolate-covered frozen bananas, double-dipped in bittersweet chocolate, just because I had mentioned that this was a childhood favorite of mine. That gift meant much more to me and felt more loving than some much more expensive ones I received at the same time. It was prepared and delivered with love.
Ask yourself, do I prefer surprise gifts or do I want to tell someone exactly what I would like for a present? Say, if a birthday or holiday is coming up. This has to do with our sense of spontaneity and adventure. One person I was close to used to give specific directions as to exactly what kind of gift was desired and would be most appreciated. It took a lot of fun out of the giving. I'm capable of buying myself exactly what I want and would much rather take the risk of someone else picking out something I just might discover I wanted, even though I hadn't thought of it. Now, this willingness to take a risk has a lot to do with security addictions. The less of those we have, the more we are willing to wait and see what happens, the less demanding we are in terms of trying to manipulate and control others. And looking at this giving and receiving process can tell you whether you, in fact, do want to control other people and what they do for you. Financial self-confidence is living your life freely, simply, directly, and trusting yourself. Someone once said that love is trusting, not testing. Loving yourself, and that's what financial self-confidence is all about, is trusting yourself, not testing.